So there's all sorts of religious laws so that he can control the church. But we do what is right according to the Bible. The Bible tells us to attend, we go to church. The Bible tells us to evangelize, we evangelize. Being a Christian is this, read your Bible, pray, memorize scripture, evangelize. And that's why the house church keep growing. Jesus never promised his followers an easy path. In fact, he told his disciples that the world would hate them. He sent them out as sheep among wolves. Jesus' words came true in the life of the apostles, and they're still coming true today in the lives of his followers around the world. Join host Todd Nettleton as we hear their inspiring stories and learn how we can help, right now on the Voice of the Martyrs Radio Network. Welcome again to the Voice of the Martyrs Radio. My name is Todd Nettleton. We are in our studio this week with a very special guest. Uh, We call him Brother Infu. He is the leader of an unregistered church inside China. You may notice his voice sounds a little different. We are changing his voice to protect his security. So uh, it is is not a, a malfunction of our technology. It is simply a way to protect him. Uh, in Chinese, Infu means blessing. So, Brother Blessing, Brother Infu, he has been our guest previously on Voice of the Martyrs Radio. In fact, the first interview we recorded with him, we recorded in China. Uh, so, this is a great blessing. Brother Infu, welcome to Voice of the Martyrs Radio. I'm so happy to be here in front of you to see you face to face. Well, we are happy as well. I want our listeners to understand some of the things that have happened in China in the last few years. I know there were some significant changes to the law as it relates to religion in 2018. What did those changes do to ministry at a local church inside the country, a a church like you lead every week? So there's all sorts of religious laws. It's always making it more difficult. Sometimes those laws have already been established and it's modified so that it can get more Christians and control the church and any religious groups and fellowships. But it has not affected the church because the church is still growing and people will just have to do church Pastors will shepherd the church. People will still go to church. Sometimes it's just a little bit more difficult. One thing has been more difficult since 2018 is that many churches cannot meet in one big group anymore. That's not possible. So they are broken into smaller groups. So the obvious challenge of that is if you're meeting in more groups, you need more leaders. How do you raise up more leaders to lead all those small groups because— As you said, now you can't meet 100 people. You need to meet 10 groups of 10 or, you know, five groups of 20. So you need five leaders instead of one. This is a challenge for the church. So can we raise up enough? So in our partner churches, in our church, we are broken into so many groups. But do we have enough men? There are men, but they are not elder qualified yet. And we want to be very slow because elders, they want to meet the qualification in... uh, in the pastoral epistle, but that's a minimum requirement in the pastoral epistle. So we want to raise them up, and we also want to raise up their wives. And oftentimes the wives are not in with them, and so it takes a long time. Raise up men is a challenge to the house church. Definitely. Women, sisters, willing to do everything. They're willing to serve. God bless their soul. They're willing to do all the things. They're willing to suffer. They're always serving. In every area, they serve. So in our church, we see how women, they attend prayer meeting. They read the Bible. They come for systematic theology. They come for all the classes. They want to go to seminary. They want to be trained. They want to be missionaries. Uh, We want to encourage them, but we want the men. We want the men to lead the church because it will affect the sisters in the long run. Families are broken because the men are not men. They are not godly men. They are weak, passive. So the wife has to be active. But you want the men to be a godly leader, to lead the family, to lead the wife, to love the wife and shepherd Christ's church. Our prayer is to raise up a few godly men. We know the reality. We're not going to raise millions of them, but we will. We want to raise godly men that can, can love their wives and shepherd Christ's church. Amen. We're talking this week on Voice of the Martyrs Radio with Brother Infu. He is the leader of an unregistered church in China. Brother, we talked about the changes in the law in 2018. 
Uh, then 2020 comes and there's COVID. And I know probably a lot of our listeners are tired of hearing about COVID. I'm tired of talking about COVID. But how did it affect the church? Did it affect the church more than it affected the general population in China? Or was it just everybody was affected equally? The churches, in the very beginning in 2020, when everything was shut down, uh, most churches didn't know what was happening. Most people just stayed at home. And then immediately after that, 2020 in January, end of January, soon, a few weeks after that, the government barricaded all the housing community. People couldn't go out. People couldn't come in. So therefore, there's no church. You can't meet. People went online. So in our church and in our partner churches all over China, immediately when they allow people to get out of their compound, which is about three months after January, probably around April, people just went out. They will find a place to congregate, not in big groups, but in smaller groups. So they met and they fellowship, they hear the word of God preach. They continue to do that. Now, some churches did not do that for a long time. If they didn't do that and it took two years or three years, those churches eventually, they have a hard time, a very difficult time to continue. People were disillusioned. People got comfortable, wake up in the morning without combing their hair in their pajamas, and they turn on the computer and they do church. And they got used to that. So they just continue. But there's no fellowship. And they get depressed because everything is on at home. They work from Monday to Friday, morning to evening. If they're single, they eat alone. Uh, they buy things and they get it delivered. They don't go out on a Saturday. They don't go to church. They do it online. Eventually, they get very, very depressed or they have all sorts of other issues. They must come to church. So in our church, it is encouraged that they come to church. And when they come to church, when they hear the word of God, when they have a community, when there's fellowship and there's breaking of bread, there's, there's the Lord's Supper, it encourages your soul. Such a simple thing. If you think about it, brother. So the Bible tells us, go to church, hear the word of God preach, sing songs, sing hymns, fellowship, breaking of bread. Such a simple thing. The moment we don't do that, there's so many consequences. So they are coming, they're worshiping, they're doing church, they're doing life together because they see the world around them. People are fearful for their lives. They are really fearful. And wearing masks and, and the police surveillance and all that thing, it's a culture of wearing masks in some ways, you know, in the subway. You're packed like sardines. One sneeze you get the spit, you get the saliva. <laughs> so it's not necessarily the virus itself, it's just the protection and also the, the pollution. But for the Christians, it could be an added advantage because the face is covered. Maybe not so easy to recognize the face. So there's a lot of benefit to that. Now, once they enter the church, the Christians, once they enter the church, mass is off. So the mass is convenient for the outside so that people don't recognize, especially in our seminary training. You wear the mask to go to the location. Once you go in, you remove your mask and you do church, you do service, you do training. Once the leaders, the elders, set the tone of the church, we're meeting, we're attending church, we're worshiping God, they go. Yes, there's always the threat of being exposed. Be it begins because the church is already illegal. So everything they do is illegal. But we do what is right according to the Bible. The Bible tells us to attend, we go to church. The Bible tells us to, to evangelize, we evangelize. So even with this watchful eyes of the government, the people evangelize. Being a Christian is this, read your Bible, pray, memorize scripture, evangelize. And that's why the house church keep growing. We're talking this week on Voice of Martyrs Radio with Brother Infu. He is the leader of an unregistered church inside the People's Republic of China. We are changing his voice to protect his security. So, Brother Infu, you mentioned the seminary. Talk to me a little bit about that training process, because you mentioned what you're doing is illegal. So this is not a above-ground seminary. This is an underground seminary. It is illegal. How do you gather people together? How long is the process 
I assume they have jobs while they're doing this. So how do they balance work and, and studies? Just kind of talk through how the seminary process works. Yes. Seminary used to be where American professors, they can come and visit and teach. And they partner together with the underground church, provide education. It has become very difficult for them to come to China to train. So now the Chinese have to train up the people. So in, like in our seminary, uh, we have to train our people more. We focus a lot on just raising up men so that they can train up other men. And I, I you know, thought, this is another prayer. We hope that the Chinese, especially Chinese students that, that came over to America to attend seminary, to be educated, they have a desire to be educated in theology, in the Bible, in ministry, and to return home to China to serve. But after they come to America, they touch the ground, the soil in America. They breathe the air in America. They eat the hamburgers. They don't go back. But the calling, the burden was the house church, but they don't go back anymore. Pray that they go back. Because right now we need Chinese men from mainland China who went to study in America, educated in Greek and Hebrew, systematic theology, the Bible and ministry, to go back to the house church. Not just the comfortable life and white picket fences and, and, and maybe a little bit more comfortable life. But that's where the action is. That's where ministry is. That's where souls are lost. Souls are going to hell. And there's no one to disciple. So this man, I taught, I want to speak to this Chinese, uh, those who have gone to seminary, go back and train the men. You know the language. You know the culture. Don't stay in America. Go where the action is. It is a rewarding ministry. It is really delighting to the soul. You know, Todd, when you see men and women, when they hear the gospel and they believe in Jesus, and, and to know how terrible their lives has been, you know, Todd, some of the counseling cases, we so wretched. They, they have sin. You know, sin is everywhere, right? You know, sin. But in this communistic environment, the sin that they have engaged in, and yet, when the gospel penetrates, when they believe in Jesus, lives change and they repent of their sin. And some of them are pastors. Amen. We're talking this week on Voice of the Martyrs Radio with Brother Enfu. He is the leader of an underground church in China. How do you how do you help Christians overcome the fear, particularly of the authorities? Because you meet this Sunday, the police could knock on the door and say, hey, we're coming in. They could take every single person that's in gathered down to the police station, interrogate all of them. They could they could bring a lot of pressure to bear. How do you help Christians not to get trapped in the fear, but to live in the in the faithfulness and to live in the yes, these bad things could happen. I'm I'm not ignorant of that, but I trust God. Yes. So Todd, if they are faithful members of the church, so church is very important. They need to be members of a local congregation. So if they are in a church, they hear the word of God preach. They know how to rely on God. And they just need to be encouraged in that community. And the community, the church body, they encourage one another. So that's a, a blessing. It's a community. Versus perhaps in the Western world, where it's more individualistic. It's very community. If you counsel, oftentimes it's a community council. <laughs> you do things together. It's a very community. So in that way, you encourage one another. It's like the book of Ephesians, Ephesians 4, the one anothering. So together in a body, you encourage together, they weep together. A lot of challenges, but everybody understands the challenges. And then people come over to encourage. Now, the police, yes, typically the leader, the main pastor or the elders will be responsible for the flock. So they will be the one taken away. The people will lose their job, but they will be warned first. So in the house church, typically, you have to know your Bible. You have to be able to preach. You have to be able to counsel. And you must face the police. That's one extra thing. 
If you're not able to face the police, you can't be a pastor in China. So, so they know that. They know that. That's their calling. And as you're leading the seminary, is that a part of the training process? Like, hey, when the police come, here's what we say, here's what we don't say, here's how we treat them, here's... Is, is that a part of the training process for, for your pastors? Because you say that, that's something they're going to have to know. Yes. So half of the students in our seminary have already gone to jail. They went to jail. So a few of them, as an example, they blessed my soul. They went to jail. Five, of, five elders went to jail in the church. They have about 200 people. The 200 people, the members didn't go to jail. They were warned, don't come back. But they took the five elders. So they took the five elders. They went to jail. They went to t- for 10 days. When they came out, they report back to me. They have the sweetest fellowship in jail. They shared the gospel. They preach to one another. The other inmates that get to hear the messages. They lost weight. They said, no, the thing is that they lost weight. They only had vegetables and rice, not much meat. No meat, actually, just vegetables. So they lost weight. They, they were joking. They said, wow, it's a good time to lose weight here. <laughs> and they had the sweetest fellowship among the five elders. Their relationship was even more intimate and closer. Typically in a seminary, they come from churches already. It's a little different from in America where typically they go to learn and go to a church. Seminary in China, they came from a church. They will be ordained in a church. Mm -hmm. So they already know the cost of it. They will be told already before they come. If not, typically they do. If not, in a seminary, we'll remind them again. And if they go to seminary, they will see the other people who had gone to jail. So they know that that is their calling. The calling to be a preacher is to lay down the lives for the brethren. They know that. They know the Bible. They will lay down. And that's why sometimes it's a challenge for the wives because the wife must also have the same calling, not just to follow the husband to be a, the husband being a preacher and being a wife of a preacher, but to be a preacher who goes to jail when the time comes. So it's, it's, it's hard. It's hard. But by the grace of God, God, he gives enough grace to his people. He will not tempt them more than they cannot. The Bible tells us, the Apostle Paul tells us that. So they will always have enough strength and God will give enough grace in that hour. And the encouraging stories that they hear, even from each other, when we were in prison, we had this amazing time of fellowship with each other. We had this amazing time of, of growing in God. That is... That's contagious. I mean, that that gets caught by others as well. And frankly, I hope it gets caught by our listeners today too. Like, hey, when hardship comes, that might be God's chance to to grow you and to increase your fellowship. We talk about sharing those stories. How much do the different house churches and, and house church networks share what I might call intelligence? Like, uh, the, the mechanics of, okay, here's how we meet together secretly and, and nobody knows. Here's the app that we use to communicate because the government hasn't got this one yet. Or this policeman is, is a tough guy. Watch out for him. He's really against the church. Is there the sharing of that kind of information? Because I know, you know, if just a random person walks into your church, you're like, whoa, wait, who are you? And are, are you here because you want to be at church or are you here spying on us? But how much of that is there sharing among the house churches? Not just the gospel sharing and the training of leaders sharing, but the kind of, like I say, intelligence sharing of here's how we operate. Here's the mechanics of what we do to keep doing what we do, even though it's illegal every single week. Oh, Todd, this is a very practical question that every church must face. So uh, if there's any new people that come to our church, they need to fill up a form first. So typically, there's no, well, there's no website. There's no billboards. Nobody knows. <laughs> there's not a big sign outside announcing it. <laughs> so how do they come? How do they know of this church? So it's all a word of mouth. So somebody, they know somebody. So that means that somebody in our church, a member of our church, will give a form for that new friend. That new friend must fill up a form, name, and when he got saved, and currently which church attending, and the purpose of leaving this church, assuming this is a Christian, professing Christian. So after answering that question, it's a simple question, then the elders will meet with that person or call. Typically, we meet face-to-face, and then to see why he wants to come to church. 
And that person, that visitor, knows somebody already. Our member already knows this person. It's okay. He's okay. So then we want to know why he wants to come. Now, let's say the reason is not good. Typically, people church hop and they don't like there's a conflict and they didn't resolve. We would encourage them. Resolve your conflicts. Go and, and reconcile. And then you can always transfer church. And we will call the leaders. They say, hey, this member, uh, he wants to come and they want to transfer please talk to your members first. And if there's a problem that needs to be solved, we are willing to come together and help. It, it has blessed other churches that other churches know that we're not trying to steal their sheep. So then when we have training, they would send confidently send their members to our training, knowing that we're not going to steal their flock. So this is a, a good thing, a blessing. Now, if it is a non-believer, uh, we welcome, obviously. We want non-believers to hear the Word of God, the Gospel. Someone in our church, they know them. There's a relationship built already. They know where and where. So with those things, it, they kind of know. Are they spies or are they from the government? So through that, it's, it, this is how we do it. Not intentionally uh -huh. to, to see which one is a spy, but mainly we want to make sure we help people transition also, another thing is that when our members want to transfer to another church, we shepherd them into our church and we shepherd them out to another church. Christians should not leave the church of God. They can go to another church, but they should always be in a church. Mm -hmm. Amen. We're talking this week on Voice of the Martyrs Radio with Brother Infu. He is the leader of an unregistered church inside China. Brother Infu, as we finish off, we always like to equip people to pray. We've talked about the need for leaders, and I know that will be on our listeners' prayer list this week, raising up leaders for the house church in China. What are some other ways that we can pray for, for China, for the country as a whole, but also specifically for our brothers and sisters there? I pray for leaders to be raised up, pastors to be raised up, the pastor's marriage life, family, that they are able to glorify God. So healthy church healthy family, because a marriage should be an example of the gospel, a display of the gospel to a broken world. So pray for pastors' marriages. Pray that the people of God in the house church, no matter how challenging their life and their situation and their circumstances are, pray that they will continue through many tribulations and focus and fix their eyes on Jesus Christ. Christ. Pray that Christ's church will be honored and glorified as they journey through this interesting time. Amen. I hope you will pray this week for our brothers and sisters in China. I pray for the church there. God is doing amazing things. You, you hear a lot about China on the news right now. You hear a lot about the politics. You hear a lot about President Xi. Uh, let's pray for God's kingdom to advance in China and especially for our brothers and sisters there. Brother Enfu, thank you so much for sharing with us. I want to encourage our listeners as well. You have been with us before. Go back and listen to some of those conversations. They have been very enlightening. I'll never forget the first time I talked to you, uh, we talked about the problem of money in the church because the church can't exist. It's, it's illegal, so you can't go down and start a checking account for your church where you park all your funds and put your tithes and offerings. And we talked about the challenge of that, and I got to tell you, I had never before thought of that as like just the mechanics of, well, how do we handle money in our church? Because our church doesn't exist legally. So what do we do? And so go back and listen to those previous conversations with Brother Enfu. You will be encouraged. Thank you for being our guest this week on Voice of the Martyrs Radio. Thank you, Todd, for having me. I also want to encourage you, this weekend is the Hearts of Fire virtual event. If you participated Friday evening, I'd love to hear what you thought of the event. If you did not participate Friday evening, you still can. Go online to heartsevent.com. You can hear the testimonies of four women who faced persecution firsthand, as well as worship music led by Michael W. Smith. Again, heartsevent.com is the website for that. Next week, we're going to share an interview from the Hearts of Fire virtual event with Anita Smith. Anita's husband, Ronnie, was killed in Libya. We're going to meet her. We're going to hear her story. You will be encouraged by her faithfulness and how God enabled her to forgive 
the people who killed her husband. That's next week. Be sure you're back with us right here on the Voice of the Martyrs Radio Network.